Turn your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want to talk to you today about progressive Christianity. This thing of, oh, we've come so far where things are really getting better. Where, you know, progressive Christianity is you're progressing towards better things. Okay? I want to prove to you from the scriptures that progressive Christianity is the system of Antichrist. All right? Uh, they're not all world religions all joining together and getting along and things like this in the, in the uh, time of Jacob's trouble with the Antichrist. That's not a teaching of the King James Bible. You actually read the scriptures and you will realize, no, it's actually one religion of worship. And that religion is going to be Roman Catholicism, not Islam or whatever else. Uh, Islam is not going to take over anything. Okay, I might do a, a video on the thing of the um, Winslow plan, I think it is. You can look that up. But the Winslow plan talks about how to wipe out Islam very quickly. And are they going to implement that? It's quite possible. I don't know. But Islam would not be hard with modern day technology to totally eradicate. And I think that that's what's going to happen. That's what the Antichrist thing is going to be about there, that he goes out conquering and to conquer. And, uh, but that's another study. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Okay? So this is a Bible-believing standard right here. You can look at the end times and say, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It gets worse. So if you are part of a movement that just showed up in the last 50, 60 years, you're part of the end times apostasy. You are part of the things that are waxing worse and worse, getting worse and worse and worse, in other words. And I've seen this thing many, many times. People will say, well, you know, um, I'm just so thankful. We have sure have come a long way. It used to be really bad in the past, and now we're, people are much more open about this and much more tolerant. That means that they're much worse sinners. Okay? And those are the people that are going to be worshiping the Antichrist one day. Uh, Bible-believing Christians know that the world is getting worse, not better. But I'm going to talk about six goals of progressive Christianity. Okay, and I use the term Christianity just as the way the world would define it. The first goal is to eliminate God's Word. Absolutely. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. Preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Every dispensation in the entire Bible ends with apostasy. It ends with a destruction, a major event happens, and the next dispensation starts every single time. And you get somebody and they come along and they say, well, you know, I, I don't think we should be King James only, and I think that no translation could be inspired, and, 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 and they go through all this stuff. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to get rid of one book. And it's funny because every new version that comes out, they all have to attack this book, this King James Bible. Every single one of them. Why? Well, as my banner here shows, because the book is the king of all the books that's ever been printed. And that's not my opinion. That is a matter of scientifically verifiable fact. How do you know? No book in history has been printed as much as this King James Bible. The authorized version, as it's properly called, the authorized version has been printed and published and everything else, you know, gotten out there. Uh, published is what I mean by publishing the word. You're getting it out. It's been put out more than any book in history. No book can, can come even close to the King James Bible. And of course, you know, they'll, a lot of times, like the new versions, they'll try to say, well, you know, it's gone into a billion copies or a million copies or something like this. It's not even close to the King James Bible. And the whole thing is the King James Bible has no copyright on it. So you're able to get this thing out. If you want to start up a printing press, you can make your own King James Bibles. Interesting. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. I'm going to show you an interesting thing about the King James Bible. Go back to the book of Ecclesiastes. 
right between Proverbs and the Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? You know, there's only one Bible that has the word, or the, the king, that uh, the, a king actually gave his royal authority to protect the translators while they were making it. Only one. Where, to, where, where the word of a king is, there is power. Hmm. And you see, uh, it says there, And who may say unto him, What doest thou? The Jesuits actually tried to stop uh, the translation of the King James Bible with the gunpowder plot and Guy Fawkes and that whole thing. They actually tried to kill King James and the members of Parliament. And their system was, you know, it failed, basically. And uh, they didn't stop it. But there's no other Bible out there that was authorized by a king. And it wasn't originally called the King James Version. As I said earlier, it was called the Authorized Version. Very interesting. But now with that in mind, King James Bible, go to Judges chapter 17. If you're newly saved, you can just pause it and look up in your index and see where the book of Judges is at. Judges chapter 17, verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Do you prefer the King James Bible? No, I prefer the message. Really? Well, I prefer the uh, New Revised Standard Version. I prefer the uh, English Standard Version. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes, you see? What do you think this is all about? I mean, do you think that the English language is going, they say, we, we need to update the King James Bible. Uh, there have been over 200 of these in the last 100 years. Since 1881, over 200 new versions have come out. Why? Why? And then you get to studying where these things came from. Put that down there. You get to studying where these things came from. And they want you to believe it's just the King James Bible coming up through and then and then, then, then you have the new versions that kind of come and they're just updatings of the King James. No, they're not. They're a completely different Bible from a completely different source. Here we have the uh, introduction, the 27th edition of the Nestle's text, the Nestle's Greek text. It says this the text shared by these two editions was adopted internationally by Bible societies and following an agreement between the Vatican and the United Bible Societies, it has served as the basis for new translations and for revisions made under their supervision. It comes from the Vatican. It says so right in the introductory to this book, to this Greek text. This is the King James Bible text, known as the Textus Receptus. This is an Alexandrian Egyptian text. They're not the same Bible. But you see, to be able to bring in a new world order, the one world church of the Antichrist, you can't have a Bible that's a perfect standard of authority. Even those people that use the King James Bible, you have to get them to the point where you teach the pastors in the seminaries that this book is not perfect that there are variant readings in Greek manuscripts and everything else. And the, the scriptures, perfect scriptures, are somewhere in the manuscripts. And this manuscript here and that text there and this here and that there. And you say, well, then how does the preacher make a living? He lies. He lies. It's been a vast conspiracy that the average person knows nothing about. They are taught in the seminary that the Bible that they hold in their hands is not perfect. It's just a translation. And you can correct it from the pulpit and everything else. And then you turn right around and you say, the scriptures, our lives are to be held accountable to the scriptures. And they hold a book in their hands and they don't believe for one second that it's God's perfect word. You say, could you prove that? Absolutely. How? Ask your pastor. 
ask your pastor if the book that he holds in his hands is God's perfect word. Ask him. And you'll see I'm right. They don't believe for one second that it's God's perfect word. And they'll probably take you off to the side and, well, I should talk to you. Well, I can talk to you about that some other time. You know why? Because they're afraid of the average person finding out this truth that I've just told you. They don't believe in God's word. Isn't that interesting? So in other words, in order for you to get to a point of having a one world church, you're going to have to get rid of the authority of Scripture. They call it, uh, you know, progressive translations and things like that. The more translations we get, the closer to the original we become. Isn't that kind of weird? Almost like a evolution philosophy. That's exactly what it is. It's evolutionary philosophy. Things get better and better and better. It's not what the Bible teaches. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Hmm. Number two, integration. Integration is a requirement if you want to bring together the world and have a new world order. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to prove it to you. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 through 39. It says here, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In the end times, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. What was going on in the days of Noah? Well, let's go back. Genesis chapter 10. You can look at Genesis chapter 6 and you can see what all is going on there. But I'm going to show you something interesting about integration from Genesis chapter 10. Noah was alive after the flood. Genesis chapter 10, verse 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. God told them to go spread out and make nations that were separate. But look what happens. Chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. This is after the Lord told them to spread out. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Isn't it interesting? So, this first world government that's recorded here, the very first time that a world government is created, God goes down and says, no, you're bringing all the nations together. I'm going to break it up. He told them, move out, spread out. He just got done destroying the world, okay? Back there with the flood. And now, a few generations have passed, and now they're starting to say, let's come together again. And the Lord says, oh, you're going to do all the evil again. You see, when you bring all the people together, all the ethnicities and all the nations together, it forms great evil. Integration is a great evil in God's sight. And again, oh, you're such a racist and whatever else. I'm not a racist. Racist means that you believe one race is superior to another and other races should be eliminated. I have never taught that. People lie about me all the time. Right? I teach division. 
segregation. Not because one is better than another, because we're different. Preserve the diversity of what God has created. But how can you have a new world order with what I teach? Segregation. How can you have a new world order? You can't. You have to bring all people together and say there is no difference. Marry who you want to marry. Come together. Do this. Do that. That's the truth of it. And I find it interesting that now people are so into interracial marriage and everybody just come together and there's no difference anymore and whatever else. And yet here in America, interracial marriage was illegal in most states until 1967. The anti-miscegenation laws. Many people don't even know about that. Are you aware of that? It was illegal to have interracial relations, you know, up until 1967. But that's okay. We're better now. You see? And you'll see this thing. You'll see this with people that are for interracial marriage, that are for integration. They will say, we have come a long way. We're better now. It's not possible if you're a Bible-believing Christian. If interracial marriage is accepted today and it wasn't in the past, then you know interracial marriage is wrong. One of many proofs. We have not come a long way going good. We're going bad. Number three, the third thing that Satan needs to do through progressive Christianity to bring in his new world order, sex perversion. Matthew chapter 24 Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12 it says here, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Iniquity shall abound. So you can't find true love. Because everybody's busy fornicating and everybody's there's sodomy going on and this and that and all this other stuff. Where are you going to find true love? Daniel chapter 11. Show you how you this how this ties in. Daniel chapter eleven, verse thirty-six through thirty-seven, speaking here of the Antichrist that's coming. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. It ties in perfectly with the prophecies about the Antichrist, about the man of sin. And it's ironic that there is already a political leader that does not have the desire of women. So who's that? The Pope. Any Pope that's ever lived is not supposed to have a desire of women. They are supposed to be celibate. And many priests within Catholicism are sodomites. The modern word is homosexual. And isn't it interesting that uh, progressive, progressive Christianity is more and more becoming tolerant of sodomy? But we've come a long way. We've come a long way. We sure has. It's, it's not like it used to be. We don't judge the homosexual, the gay people and the uh-huh. You have to do that, you see. If you're going to bring in the Antichrist kingdom, these things have to be done away with. As far as, you know, prohibitions in Scripture against sodomy and things like that. Number four, you have surveillance and the Internet. That's another thing that progressive Christianity is very, very much into. In fact, almost worships. And it's necessary to bring in the system of Antichrist. Let me show you. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, just right across there to the next chapter. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. You say, well, that sounds like a good thing. can be, but it can also be a very bad thing. Let me ask you a question. Are there some things that you found out that you know now that you wish you wouldn't have found out? Are there some times that you've clicked on a video or opened up a book or looked at a magazine and later you wish you hadn't seen that? You have knowledge. You know, 
there's child pornography out there. People looking at child pornography. Well, I should probably study it as a preacher, you know, and look at it firsthand so I can tell whether it's right or wrong. No, I don't need to see it. I don't need to have knowledge of the intricate details of how the thing looks or works or whatever. I don't need to know. I don't want to know about that stuff. You see what I'm saying? But how long would it take me to find that stuff if I looked it up online? You just assume that knowledge is a good thing because you think, well, knowledge is, is great and everything. Not necessarily. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. There's a lot of people, you know, that, oh, they have knowledge right at their fingertips. They take knowledge everywhere they go with their cell phone, their smartphone, and all this other stuff. What's it doing to them? Are they better people? No. A lot of people, they can't even figure out anything without their cell phone being present. Anytime you ask them, well, you know, I've got to think of how this numbers works out. Or they're getting their cell phone out and they're looking, they're trying to get their, to their calculator or something like that. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Knowledge isn't necessarily a good thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 2. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. Hmm. And I find it so interesting that something people didn't even have 20 years ago, now most people can't live without. You got to have your cell phone there and everything else that's hooked up to Facebook and all this other social media type of stuff. And everywhere you go, you got to have the thing on you at all times. And it comes out, you know, well, these things put off an electrical field and you look in the warning stuff inside the cell phone, the smartphone, and it actually tells you in there that you're supposed to keep it a couple inches away from your face. Don't put it right against your skin. And there are stories of women putting them down in their bra or whatever else and they're getting breast cancer. Story after story after story, professionals coming out and saying, yeah, they, they do put off an electrical field and, and I think the cancer thing is going to happen there and whatever, it's kind of dangerous. People don't care. They keep their cell phones. Comes out, oh, well, the uh, government can track you and trace you wherever you go with the GPS chip that's in your cell phone. People don't care. They could care less. And you say, well, do you have a cell phone? Brian, do you have a cell phone? No, I don't. I honestly do not. I don't want a cell phone. But you see, Revelation chapter 13, let's turn there. I'll show you how it ties in. Revelation 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth, ex exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, for years and years and years, preachers have drawn statues of this Antichrist guy, you know, standing there or whatever else, and you've got to fall down and worship. I don't think that that's it at all. An image is something that you can put in video. And you could have the Antichrist do a uh, daily, you know, sermon or some kind of daily proclamation to people and whatever else, and they could all be looking at their cell phones and doing that. You got the thing with you all the time. It tracks wherever you go. Controls buying and selling. I say, is that the mark of the beast? No, I think the mark of the beast is going to be in the right hand or in the forehead. Or Revelation 20 also says about upon the forehead. So it's going to be attached to the person. But I think cell phones are going to tie into it. You can now have these barcodes and QR codes especially. 
the QR code can actually be scanned by a cell phone and it'll bring up the person's information, bring up their Facebook page. It's all interconnected, you see. The mark of the beast is going to be uh, implantable microchip or uh, some kind of QR code or something on the forehead that's going to be scannable. But the whole thing is it's going to integrate into cell phones, into social media on the internet. What modern church is warning people about that stuff? What modern church has a preacher that stands up in the pulpit and says, hey, you shouldn't be having your cell phones. Them things are bad. Well, that would be old-fashioned, wouldn't it? What are you trying to get us back into the 1800s, Brian? Well, it'd be a much better place than this. Yeah. You see? People 30 years ago didn't even have to have these cell phones. Now everybody's got to have one now. I, can, I am living proof to tell you, no, you don't have to have one. Interesting. Again, progressive Christianity. Oh man, we're just we we don't do that old stuff anymore. Oh, you you're horse and buggy days, and you want to live like you know, non-electric and whatever else, and away from technology. Uh, oh, we're so much cooler than that now. Our church is so cool. It's so high tech. We got all this these neat programs and everything else. And I have a, a study that I did years ago. Went to this Calvary in, Independent Church or whatever it's called there. Um, and uh, down in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And they have biometric thumb scanners. You know, scan your fingerprints into the church's system. I mean, Christians years ago would have just gone wild about this. Now it's just, oh, cool, i got to do this? Yeah, sure. You know, biometrics. Cashless withdrawals of your tithe and stuff like this. Hook up your bank account to the church and all that other stuff, and they'll take out the tithe automatically. Which transitions into the next thing? A cashless economy. Revelation chapter 13, since we're right here. Verse 16 through 18. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Three score is sixty, if you're wondering. So 666, 666 is the number there. And I find it interesting, again, a mark to buy and sell. There's no cash being used in this time. Cash will be worthless. Gold and silver will be worthless unless you can take that stuff in and have it redeemed and put into your account as digital currency. And all this other stuff, Bitcoin and all these other things that they're coming out with, it's all digital, you know? And again, what do modern Christians think about it? Are they, are they weirded out by it or warned off by it and things like that? Of course not. Hey, the quicker the technology, the easier it is for me, the better. But here's what you have to realize about this whole Mark of the Beast thing. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now I say these modern professing Christians, they're lost. Uh, these people don't really understand repentance that leads to salvation, the whole thing. Um, they're just, it's life enhancement is all that modern churches are teaching and preaching. Okay, uh, come to Jesus, he's a great guy and you'll have a great life and everything else and be part of the social club that we have here called the church. We'll talk about that in the next point. But uh, that's what's going on. So these people are gonna go into this time of Jacob's trouble. People call it the Great Tribulation. That's not actually the real term for it. And the body of Christ is leaving before then. But these modern professing Christians, they're going right into that time period, and they are already being conditioned mentally that there's nothing wrong with the cashless assist, uh, money system and all that other stuff. They're going to go right into it, you see. And they're going to take whatever mark, and it's going to be cool and trendy, and it's going to line up with their church system. And when you take that mark and you worship the beast and his image, you are guaranteed 
100% guarantee that you're going to go to hell and burn forever. 100% guarantee. There's no forgiveness. There's no, well, I'm sorry I made a mistake. Nope. It's a very, very serious thing. Finally, number six, we have church buildings and a return to Roman Catholicism. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 5. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, three and a half years in other words. But did you look there in verse 4? And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast. Um, where do you worship at? You know what that means today? It means where do you go to church? People have associated the word church with a building. Never once in the New Testament has a church ever been anything but the group, group of people, saved Christians. And they can get together, and that's called a church. But Catholicism came up with this idea of taking Greek Parthenons and putting a phallic uh, steeple on top of it, and then it becomes a church building. You say, oh, now, I don't know. Okay, let me ask you, I'll just issue a challenge to anybody out there. Please contact me and let me know of one Christian, non-Roman Catholic, one Christian church building that's 500 or more years old. Let me know about one, okay? I'll give you a little hint, there aren't any. Christians did not meet in church buildings up until very, very recently, the last couple hundred years. They started to take things after the Protestant Reformation. They started to take things from Roman Catholicism. They wanted to reform Catholicism, reform it, restructure it, in other words. Hmm. It's kind of an interesting thing. Let me show you what church is supposed to be, according to the New Testament. The book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. It says here, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The body of Christ comes together. That's the building. Each one of us is a temple of of, of the Holy Ghost. We have the Holy Spirit of God living within us. And so you bring Christians together, we're built together into a holy temple of God. Where you meet, go into some building and stuff like that, and they say, well, it doesn't matter if you meet in a home or if you meet in a building that people call a church. Oh, yes, it does matter. Because when you go into a building and you call that thing a church, now you start to set up this dual life thing. See, Christians that meet in a home or that meet out in the field or meet out wherever, they're not living a double life, okay? Uh, I mean, show me where Sunday best is. And I've got plenty of videos on the whole house church thing. Um, but the fact is, when you go into a building and you call the building church, all of a sudden you start to say, well, I wouldn't do this in church, meaning the building. Don't tell me that they don't. I've gone to church buildings for a long, long time. Been in and out of them, preached in the pulpits, the whole deal. There's a double life there. What you do when you're not in church and what you do when you are in church. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. The Antichrist system has to use this progressive Christianity. It's going to bring people right back to Roman Catholicism again. Because they'll say, after all, they were the ones that started a lot of this stuff that we're doing today as Christians. So they're kind of the 
early church and things, and so we should kind of go back with that whole deal and whatever else. And the Pope, some Pope is going to show up someday, and he's going to be the Antichrist, the man of sin. Lines up perfectly with Scripture. So if you are in some kind of a system, as I said at the beginning, if you are in some kind of a system, religious system, that has only existed, what you're doing, has only existed for the last 50, 60 years, um, you better think really long and hard. Actually, you don't really have to think very long and hard. You better just get out of it, okay? You are in a system that is heading towards Antichrist worship. Examine yourself whether you be in the faith, okay? Thank you for watching.